it was 9.40 a.m. They searched through the other bins but were unable to find the head, arms or legs, so initially they were unable to identify who this torso belonged to. I think it's safe to say, though, they probably had a good idea that the torso belonged to Lauren Giddings. Randy further said that he had never seen anything like this before, and only a true monster could have done it. Now, you're probably thinking, weren't David and Joe suspects? Yes, absolutely, especially Joe, because he was the last person to have been with Lauren when she left his apartment the morning after their celebration together. Lauren's friends recalled that they hadn't actually seen her leave. Joe had only told them that she had left early. Many of the friends say that they did suspect Joe may have had something to do with Lauren's disappearance. They later expressed their guilt at having suspected him, but of course, it wasn't a good look for Joe. He participated fully in the police investigation, though. He had told them that when Lauren had left in the morning, she told him that he was going to the pool, and when investigators pulled Lauren's financial records, they saw that she had paid for admission to the Healy Country Club swimming pool that morning, just as Joe has said. When searching her car, they found the receipt for the Zaxby's drive through They analysed Lauren's computer, and the police found an email that Lauren had sent to David. She said that she had felt uneasy, and she expressed concerns that she thought someone may have tried to break into her apartment while she was away the night before. David was also participating with the detectives in the investigation. On the night in question, he had actually been away on a golfing trip in California. Investigators did, however, find it strange that they hadn't spoken for an extended period of time. David was able to provide full proof that he wasn't in Georgia at the time of Lauren's disappearance. Both men were soon ruled out as suspects. Earlier in the morning, police had been knocking on the doors of neighbors' apartments and Stephen McDaniel had already been interviewed twice. Unaware that any remains had been found, McDaniel and Lauren's other friends attended Macon Police Station to make a recorded statement. During his interview, the police asked McDaniel for permission to search his apartment, which at first he denied. His excuse? He said, the inside of his apartment there were firearms, swords, and he didn't want people near them. Suspicions started to grow about McDaniel. Again, they asked for permission to have a look through his apartment, and finally he agreed but he was told that everybody else had given permission and it was only him that didn't. They said, look how this is starting to look. Just before ending the interview, Detective Patterson asked Stephen to stand up and lift his shirt. He wanted to check for marks on his body. Stephen complied and he had two red scratches on the right-hand side of his abdomen. He was unable to tell detectives how he had gotten them. He told the detectives that he had no idea or how he received those scratches. Detective Patterson, unconvinced by the story, told him that they looked like fingernail scratches. They took photos. This came up later when he was brought into the station that evening for further interrogation. With that interview concluded, Detective Patterson took Stephen back to Barristers Hall, where he was met by a district attorney's investigator and two assistant district attorneys, to conduct the walkthrough of McDaniel's apartment under the guise that they were looking for Lauren. Around five hours after finding the torso, cadaver dogs Cinco and Chance were brought to the apartment complex by dog handler Tracy Sargent. At around 2.15pm, Tracy, Cinco and Chance began a walk around the apartments and it was reported that the dogs gave alerts, signs that they found what they're looking for, on several occasions. In particular, in Lauren's apartment, at the front door and in the bathroom, inside a vacant apartment downstairs from Lauren's apartment in the bathroom and in the living room, and in Stephen's apartment both in the bedroom and the bathroom. Finally, twice more, once at the door, two, and once inside the laundry room. Stephen's defence team argued that this was inadmissible because it wasn't captured on camera, and the use of these dogs failed to meet the test for admissible expert testimony. Until this point, McDaniel was still completely unaware that the torso had been found. It's easy to imagine that actually he was probably feeling like he was home free. The police may have been suspicious of him, but until now, nothing had been found, and he was sure in himself that they wouldn't. 
At around 2 p.m., this is where the story takes a weird twist. After the initial search of his apartment, the detective told Stephen that they couldn't release the apartment back to him and he needed to leave. When he left, he was headed in the direction of the law school across the street and he encountered media journalists. McDaniel agreed to be interviewed for one of the local news channel crews from WGXA TV. They were hanging around on site and they wanted to talk to neighbours. There are a number of opinions circulating about his appearance. In particular, many people have said that he was looking dishevelled and unkempt and he had crazy eyes. He absolutely did. But do we think that only because we know what we know now or because we are judgy? The interview starts off without incident. He plays the part of a worried friend very well. He's in a very chatty mood. The strangest part of it all is how much information he actually knows about Lauren. People who don't know any better would assume that they were very close, the best of friends. For someone who wasn't a friend, and as we know, they didn't have much to do with each other, he was extremely knowledgeable about Lauren, her movements, and even recounted stories for the news crew like he had lived them with her. At one point he suggested that Lauren may have been out on a run and someone snatched her. The interviewer continued asking a few leading questions, wanting to get their edits for the evening news. McDaniel keeps repeating, we don't know where she is. Going on to say how he and her friends had attended her apartment to see if anything was amiss, and he said, the door was locked when we got there, we just don't know where she is. Obviously, his concern was all an act because he knew exactly where Lauren was the entire time. He wasn't really concerned about Lauren. The decision had been made earlier by law enforcement not to release the fact that the torso or anything for that matter had been found. They wanted to wait until they'd made a positive ID on the body. Unfortunately, keeping it under wraps was not meant to be. The news crew had heard about it somehow, and this was how the news was broken to the world, including to Lauren's family. It was Lauren's uncle who first heard about the body being found by watching the news reports that evening. He called the family to ask how they were, and the family, of course, hadn't been told anything about the body being found in the apartment complex at that stage. This is when the reporter says, I think they recovered a body in the parking lot area, and asked if he knew anything about it, Stephen. There's a very visual moment where Stephen McDaniel appears to think to himself, oh fuck. He swallows hard. His face goes white and he looks like his stomach literally just fell to his ankles. He's visibly shaken by the revelation and he asks, a body? Like maybe he's misunderstood what they've said to him. The news crew keeps asking questions but McDaniel puts on the performance of a lifetime. He says he needs to sit down, acting as though he's had the rug pulled from under him and he's distraught to learn that Lauren may be dead. Oh my God, eye rolls. Check out the video. It's infuriating to see him thinking that he's fooling everybody. I've shared the video from our friends at Across the Table on our Facebook page. It's around 11 minutes long. It's all of the interviews that McDaniel gave that afternoon. It's unclear when he went back to give other interviews because in a police report, one of the officers wrote that he was completely unresponsive, staring off into space like he was catatonic and that they had to perform a sternal rub. Now, a sternal rub is one of the most common painful stimuli used by EMTs when patients are not responding to verbal stimuli. Upon hearing the news of the body discovery, Mr. Giddings, who was now in Georgia, rushed to the Macon police station. He was told by investigators, though, that he shouldn't see the body like this, insisting that this was not how he should remember his daughter. DNA testing later confirmed that the torso was that of Lauren without Mr. Giddings needing to go through that ordeal. After his media interviews, Stephen went back to his apartment, still quote-unquote in shock after learning the news of the body being found on the premises. Detective Patterson was still there and he asked Stephen to sign a form that would give them consent to search the apartment. Stephen didn't respond to Patterson and he didn't sign the form. From there, he was placed in the mobile command center which was a vehicle that had been set up at the apartment complex. 
Detective Patterson used this opportunity to return to the detective bureau and complete the interviews of Lauren's friends. Based on the alerts given by Cinco and Chance, he requested a search warrant for Stephen's apartment. The wording of the purpose for the warrant was to search and seize blood, blood spatter, body parts, body tissue and fluids, knives, cutting implements and instruments capable of dismembering a human body, cleaning and laundry supplies, garbage bags, paint and painting tools, which are evidence of the crime of murder. The warrant was issued at 8.42 p.m. and was executed at 11 p.m. Within hours, Detective Patterson had applied for another search warrant for Stephen's apartment and yet another for his vehicle, which was a 1997 Geo Prism. These were all issued at 1.55 a.m. on July 1st and they were executed at 3 a.m. the same day. Another one at 12.39 p.m. on July 3rd was issued. The fourth search warrant was for the collection of hair samples, saliva, fingernail clippings, and to take full body photographs. They did execute that particular warrant at 3.15 a.m. There's more to this part of the story, but let's go back to Lauren's apartment first. At 6 p.m., the crime scene investigators had conducted a luminol examination in Lauren's apartment. Luminol is used to detect blood at crime scenes under black light. I know I don't have to tell you, but just in case you didn't know. The examination revealed substantial amounts of blood around the drain of the bathtub and spatters on the wall to around four feet above the bath. Detective Patterson returned to the apartments and gave the search warrant to the sergeant from the crime lab. He and five other officers searched inside Stephen's apartment. There were weapons everywhere. They made note of an AK semi-automatic rifle, a samurai sword, several large knives and a couple of handguns, and also a large cooler by the front door, which Patterson thought was worthy of noting. Investigators also found two keys in Stephen's apartment. One of them was a master key that opened every door in the apartment complex, and the other was the key to Lauren's apartment. Stephen was not authorized to be in possession of either of those. Detective Patterson decided that they needed to speak to McDaniel some more, and he was interviewed further later that evening, until the early hours. That video is also posted online in full. It's two hours of interrogation, and the entire time, Stephen's odd behavior is completely out of this world. He sat straight in his chair, his palms flat on the table, moving his head only every now and then. There's actually a period of the video where Stephen sits for 16 minutes. He never requested an attorney. After seeing Stephen being so willing to chat and talk about Lauren earlier on the news, it was a very contrasting video of him later that night in the police station. Detective Patterson made a point about this very early on in the interview. He was just giving one word answers. He was completely disconnected and bizarre. The detective continues to ask questions and eventually Stephen moves from the monosyllabic closed answers to giving just a few more words, but he speaks like he's someone in a trance or under hypnosis. The answers that he's giving are yes, no, I don't know, or I don't understand. Even Detective Patterson makes mention of the fact earlier that day that he and Stephen had sat there talking to each other like normal and he was completely fine. Now he was shutting down and acting like something was wrong. This drew attention to him. He asked point blank, are you scared? To which Stephen answered, he wasn't. The detective asked Stephen if over the weekend he had gone to the Kroger supermarket or to the Walmart over the past weekend. Stephen said that he couldn't remember, he didn't know. He was asking because after he appeared on the news that evening, a checkout operator from the Walmart called the police tip line and said that she remembered the quote-unquote crazy-looking man from the TV. He had checked out at her register two days before Lauren was murdered. The cashier recalled that McDaniel had been there with another man, who she said was moody. The pair had bought a tarp, some rope, and hacksaw blades. She specifically asked if he was doing some home renovation projects, and the man refused to answer, walking off, and McDaniel went with him. The investigators took the tip seriously. However, by then, Daniel had been in the news cycle for days. People were seeing the clips regularly, especially his theatrics, collapsing and sobbing on TV. 
Still, detectives reviewed the security footage from June 23rd when the cashier believed that she'd seen McDaniel and his friend. Unfortunately, it wasn't him. However, although the tip...